Sure. So I was really pleased that there were some people here that could actually read and translate that um, quote from Paul Gauguin in 1897. Um, you know, in imperial France, and everything was scientific and mechanical, um, it, driven by uh, a consumer economy, uh, going gangbusters, and and so was the reach of their empire, and uh, and so they moved into into Tahiti. Um, and Gauguin was one of those first people to kind of step back from nature and explore human relationships with nature. You know, we, we, he had the, um, he came from a society that had the affluence to be able to step aside from nature. You know, <coughs> it, it, it's not like living in Maine where we just got our plastic up, you know, for the winter. Um, you know, there we're driven by nature. But anyway, yeah, um, I, what I want to do is uh, take a little trip down memory lane, a little reminiscence here about where the anti-nuclear effort where New England coalition comes from and who we are and where we're going. Um, I found this little placard um, this morning getting ready to go and, and it's I think it's appropriate. Every um, campground and um, natural park land in Maine features this little placard. <clears throat> uh, I just want to remark and preface, you know, um, the nuclear industry has brought in a large polluting industry, um, much of the radioactive materials that were created in its 40 plus years of operation are still right there. Um, and not counting the fuel, every, every inch of fuel that was ever radiated in that plant is still right there. But the radioactive materials that escaped confinement, everything about our effort uh, has really been to contain those materials. So they would not escape either through accident or through the slop of operations. And um, so anyway, that's, that's where we're headed. Let's have the next slide, please. This is a translation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the leadership in the anti-nuclear movement and the environmental movement has often been accused of being politically driven um, and naive about the science of nuclear energy. Um, if we really understood it, we wouldn't be opposing it, is the basic thrust of the... Uh, of the lie. Well, I was about to mention MIT. <laughs> Do they lie at MIT? Well, this... In New, in, New, in New England, this is a focus point, um, a, a center for the um, dispersal 
of a new generation of nuclear power. We've had Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, and here we go again, Gen. We have another um, effort with small modular reactors, with a thorium fuel cycle. Um, the uh, graduate students at MIT um, have designed literally dozens of reactors to solve all the problems of nuclear energy, and they're busy um, promoting these ideas. Um, our start was not with outsiders, politically driven. Uh, our start goes back to the people that were part of the research and development of nuclear physics itself. Um, and they were insiders. This man, John Goffman, um, is certainly my part of my early inspiration in working on this in this field. He helped to isolate the first gram of plutonium ever isolated. At Berkeley. Yeah. So it's not like he didn't know what he was talking about. And he very early on began to ring the alarm bells. He had a PhD in nuclear physics um, and a uh, medical doctorate as well with a follow-up medical doctorate. Um, his thesis, uh, based on epidemiology largely, was that low-level radiation is harmful way out of proportion to the amount of exposure. That's somewhere other than a, a simple linear track, meaning a lot of exposure, a lot of damage, little exposure, little damage. Goffman actually bumped that line in his work um, and paid a lifetime of penalty for that. Everybody recognize this man? No, of course not. Anyway, this is Herman Muller. Herman Muller was a uh, pioneer research geneticist. In 1934, what do we have? A is it Professor Dr. Muller? Yes. Who, who was the first guy to say there is no small amount, however, small with, of radioactivity which might affect um, the growth or whatever. That, that's safe. That's right. right. No, safe no safe level. No safe level. Yeah. No safe level. Muller, 1934, is working with uh, fruit flies and, uh, and uh, various kinds of uh, little annelid worms and microbes and whatever, and, and uh, scaling back the amount of radiation to which he was exposing them and finding damage, 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 damage all the way along the line. Uh, there have been a spate of articles recently trying to undo this hypothesis that draws a straight line from lots of radiation and lots of damage down to a teeny weeny amount of radiation and a teeny weeny amount of damage, a straight line hypothesis with no point at which there stops being damage. So it's called the linear no threshold uh, hypothesis. That was this man. <clears throat> Recently, he's been accused of having uh, uh, manipulated his data and purposefully misled the world for the last, I don't know, you count them from 1934. 84 years. Yeah, at least, right? Yeah. yeah. He won a Nobel Prize, I think it was in the 1940s. And let me just add, because most folks may, may not have gotten this, but in reading his work, he theorizes that genetic damage occurs, is replicated, occurs again, is replicated uh, as 
the genes pass on their material in a, in a wave-like form. That at some point those waves will reinforce and the departure from whatever was normal in the first place will become significantly larger. He said, you really won't see the great wave of genetic damage for at least 50 generations. Well, in a way I'm kind of glad about that because I won't see it, but I think people I care about, which is the future people, will. Um, and it's too late. Is the, is the hard news there. By the way, this stirs our passions. Our passions are really all we have to, to work on. This guy is a pro-nuclear and stayed pro-nuclear his whole life long. Um, he is known, though he didn't like the term, as the father of the hydrogen bomb, Teller. Edward Teller, a really mean SOB that uh, when the McCarthy hearings were on, uh, hustled to Washington to undercut his colleagues in order to boost his own career. An awful person. But for anti-nuclear people, an inspiration in a sense, um, when he wasn't lying, he was telling the truth. <laughs> and like so many of us. Yeah, Edward Teller in 1965 Petroleum Journal said, and I have to paraphrase here because I didn't bother to write it out, that nuclear power plants do not belong on the face of the earth. Why? Because a nuclear power plant can cause far more damage than a nuclear weapon because its poisons will seep slowly out to cover the area around the reactor. He said, we should put nuclear power plants deep underground. Well, this is, a, this is, this is, you can't say it any better. This is from the horse's mouth. Um, we, we don't have to apologize for acting on the words of our opponents. Um, we don't, we don't have to apologize on on acting on the words of people who are recognized as leaders in the field that we're criticizing. This is Dr. Alice Stewart. She's a physician, radiologist uh, in England in the 50s. She was doing a lot of um, breast x-rays, euphemistically called mammograms. I can see where you wouldn't want a breast x-ray, but hey, a mammogram sounds nice. Anyway, what she, what she started doing was keeping minute records of the people who came into her clinic and correlating the number of breast x-rays that they had with the number of cancers that were popping up. And yeah, two, two things came out. One is that if you kept looking, sooner or later you were going to find one. So it was really good to keep looking. In other words, keep taking the x-rays. But then it occurred to her, <clears throat> maybe the x-rays were causing these cancers. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> she published, I think in Lancet, um, a British medical journal, her, her findings, and they were very humble. I mean, she basically said, you know, here are the correlations. We, what can we draw from this? And uh, 
So she led a, a lifetime of persecution and, and castigation, um, uh, but was ultimately um, justified, vindicated is the word I was looking for, it's ultimately vindicated um, when the, the scientific and medical community acknowledged that there was a, a trade-off. Yes, this is the, from the era of the beginning of New England coalition. Underneath that uh, framework is the uh, Vermont Yankee reactor under construction. Really? That's the reactor. Yeah. So we're back here at about 1971. Um, I want to I want to point out that, and I don't think Diana remembers this. I don't know if she was even part of the team, but when we were having meetings in Wiscasset, Maine, about the building of Maine Yankee, it's contingent of two or three people, maybe as many as four, came over from the England Coalition to talk about the inadvisability of getting into that. Next one, please. Yeah. This is a, mo a mod modified version of New England Coalition's first um, logo. Question mark in a, in a nucleus of an atom, a schematic of, a, of an atom. <clears throat> New England Coalition was founded not so much to uh, propagate its perceived truths we weren't out there to uh, um, be apostles of anti-nuclear position. It was founded to ask questions which were not being asked. It did not then and never has uh, cons consisted of uh, radicals or extremists or uh, politically motivated people. They were people that did what scientists are supposed to do. And by the way, the early uh, group contained a number of, of scientists. We had cooperation from a number of university people. Um, and you know, we still do. Um, they were, they were doing what scientists are supposed to do. You're supposed to ask the questions, ask all the questions, including the hard questions. Um, regulators, industry promoters typically don't like that. Um, they have a ownership kind of mentality about the information. We'll give you what you need um, sort of thing. I, let's do it again. Oh. <sighs> yes. I'm just going to relay a few episodes, events in the history of uh, New England Coalition since I came on board, which was 10 years after its founding. Um, and this is in the early 90s. <clears throat> this is the reactor vessel from the Yankee Road nuclear power station being taken out. <sighs> Yankee Row was down for repairs, um, and a number of safety issues arose, which is typically what happens when these plants are down. It's as Debbie Katz says, that's we kick them when they're down. Um, one issue came out of uh, the French nuclear industry. The French, the French are much underrated for their uh, hard uh, Gallic intelligence. You know, they 
the French were testing their reactors. When the reactors were being refueled in between fuel loads, the French would close all the valves and pump them full of water to about 125 percent of any maximum pressure that could be expected even under accident conditions. We never did that. We didn't dare. After a time, the French were finding minute cracks in the surface, inner surface of their reactor vessels. Stress corrosion cracking, micro fissures, whatever they wanted to call them, they were finding these little cracks. And they advised the uh, U.S. nuclear regulators, the NRC by this time, uh, this is in uh, the late 1980s, that <clears throat> because of heating and cooling reactor vessels, because of putting them under great pressure, pressure um, of a uh, PWR, pressure water reactor, like uh, Rho is about 2,000 pounds per square inch when it's operating. A lot of pressure for a big vessel like that. <sighs> they were finding that the reactor vessels, with all of this stress, were becoming, becoming hardened. They use the analogy of a paperclip. You bend it so many times, you can actually see the grains developing in the metal before the paperclip breaks. It has become hardened with the exercise. This was happening with reactor vessels, and uh, <clears throat> it was this little pup here went online, I think, in 62, I think was the date. It was one of the oldest ones, one of the first ones, and it was suspected of reactor vessel hardening. Typically, the industry puts uh, pieces of metal on a holder inside the reactor and call it a test coupon. <laughs> Have you redeemed your test coupons lately? And they can take it out and they can put it in a laboratory and pull it apart or bend it until it breaks or hit it with a hammer and see what happens or, or heat it up red hot and dip it in ice water and see what happens. They can do different things with the coupon that you wouldn't want to try with your neighborhood reactor. Um, <clears throat> Yankee Row could not certify their reactor because they had lost the test coupon. Don't know where they went. Um, the New England Coalition and the Union of Concerned Scientists intervened in this matter. And I'm not sure what the um, government action was that was underway concerning Roe. But they intervened and raised the issue of this Hardening. Um, the same as embrittlement. It's a word that anti-nuclears are accused of inventing. In the reactor had gotten more brittle. We didn't know how much. NRC insisted, along with Roe, that the reactor go at least one more fuel cycle because it couldn't be proven that it was brittle and probably it wasn't and probably even if it did crack no sufficient amount of material would escape to harm the public and so on and so forth. Um, so they ran it a couple of fuel cycles and then called it quits because of economic conditions for business purposes had nothing to do with safety they were they were shutting down um, that what was really the pet reactor in New England. This thing was built as a demonstration reactor 
for President Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program. They used to bring all the foreign dignitaries there to look at their pretty reactor. Oh, there it goes out. And New England Coalition was on the spot in this episode. I call it winning. Oh, um, yeah, this is, this is what a boiling water reactor looks like. And uh, this is a little story that comes from <clears throat> probably along about the period of time I really first got tired of the Young Coalition back in around 1990-something, I don't know, a long time ago. Two New England Coalition people, a trustee and a, and a friend who later became a trustee, um, Mike Daly and Michael Mulligan, who had once been an auxiliary operator at VY, uh, were looking at heat removal numbers for Vermont Yankee. This is not Vermont Yankee, but it is exactly the same design. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Reactors make a lot of heat. They got to get rid of a lot of heat. In the, in the steam cycle, they have to dump three quarters of the heat. If they have an accident and they have to shut everything down, they have to find a place to put their what's called decay heat. This is the heat that's produced as radioactive materials spit out their radioactivity, decay heat. It's only about 5% of the operating heat, but it's enough to melt down the reactor. I have to get rid of it somewhere. <clears throat> um, in a pressure water reactor, like the little previous thing we saw, they build a huge jumongous concrete containment over the thing, reinforcing rod everywhere. Um, at the base, the walls are like six feet thick. They go up to just maybe 18 inches or two feet at the top of the dome. It's lined with steel. Its purpose is if the reactor breaks and all the steam and heat get out of the reactor, this massive container will contain it. That's the purpose of it. Very expensive. General Electric had a better idea. General Electric put a very thin, uh, so thick, steel shell around the reactor. That's this bulb-shaped gizmo right here. And there's no way it could ever hold the heat and steam from a nuclear accident. No way in hell could it hold it. It wasn't designed to. It was designed to hold it just for a split second until a series of tubes, and this may be them on this design, I'm not sure, but a series of tubes could open their valves, dump the steam into a pool of water, in this case, contained in this circular construction. Yeah, it's called a torus, the same as a donut. Uh, it holds a bazillion gallons of water. It's cold water, very important. The steam goes into the cold water, condenses, and so the steam pressure drops, it collapses as it goes into this cold water. Yeah. When that water gets hot enough, of course, it, it's, the con condensation stops. The chilling stops. So you pump water in, out, in, out, in, out, to replace that water. Where do you get it? From the river. Pump that water in, get it cool enough, so that that steam continues to condense. Now in ordinary operations, when you're not having an accident, the heat, the heat 
around here is terrific. If you go visit the, an operating boiling water reactor and you walk in on the floor, which is about at this level, you can feel the heat from 10 or 15 feet away. It's like a, the same as a wood stove in a way, you know, you just, there it is. Well, <clears throat> in regular operations, that heat heats up the water in the torus. It gets to a certain level. It's not going to condense the steam if you have an accident. So you have to bring that water temperature down. What you do is you pump water in from the river. You pump hot water out back in the river. You pump water in. It's called service water, not cooling water. It's service water intended to cool the torus. Mike Daly and Mike Mulligan looked at the numbers and they found out that in the middle of summer when the river is hot you can't bring down the temperature in that torus enough to condense the steam of a accident, loss of coolant accident. So they filed with NRC. I'm not sure if that was a, 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 an enforcement petition, but we intervened that NRC, NEC did, the case was undertaken. The company went back to their drawing boards, sharpened all the pencils, came up with somewhat better numbers, but not quite good enough. And they were forced to put in administrative limits that would require them to power the reactor down, cooler, not quite so hot, on those days in the summer when the river water temperature rose to a dangerous level. New England Coalition did that. Well, also, they, the New England Coalition intervention requ required the building of the cooling tower at the very onset New England Coalition, Audubon, a number of uh, allies brought that question forward and of a consequence the cooling towers were built because during the summer of course that this is this is now not service water but cooling water to condense the steam um, it would not be released wholesale to the river. That's yeah, true. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Anybody recognize that one? Who, who said Seabrook over here? Good man. Yeah, this is Seabrook. Oh, right here, you see these little rods sticking up in that flat? Pl that was where the second reactor was supposed to go. I'm not much on demonstrations. I, I actually spoke at a rally at, at Seabrook. Um, we were announcing a citizen referendum in Maine uh, to close Maine Yankee. I thought it was big news. I, I had to wait all day long to get on the speaking platform, and then I was put on behind a lady who, who lived 40 or 50 miles from the plant, but her duck was depilitated, and she was certain it was from radiation. <laughs> that was a hard act to follow. <laughs> yeah, but citizen action, I think, largely discouraged the management of Seabrook. It discouraged investors in Seabrook. It really throttled down the money flow, um, and they decided that they could not sustain a second uh, reactor on that site, and so it wasn't built. And, yeah. New England Coalition, very early on, when I, when I, for my career with New England Coalition, intervened on the licensing of Seabrook, and one of the issues <clears throat> was emergency response planning, evacuation. Um, there's a highway, Seacoast Highway, that runs on this side of the plant, another one that runs on this side with little narrow roads in between. 
In the summertime, there's 500,000 people get on the beach, Hampton Beach. You're not going to evacuate them. I was privileged to represent New England Coalition in congressional field hearings that were held in Boston on the evacuation of Seabrook. And um, yeah. You want to mention so, the concrete? Well, this is a contemporary issue. Um, Seabrook is up for relicensing. They applied for a new license 20 years in advance of their uh, death of the old license. Uh, we intervened on the basis of emergency response and whether or not they calculated the right amount of radionuclides. Let me come back to the radionuclides thing, remind me. Um, but anyway, we intervened on that and then in the middle of our intervention, um, an intervention, by the way, is stepping into a legal process. Um, not like a drug intervention, but it's, it's an intervention. You get in the middle of it. And any time the government undertakes um, to do a large project, one that has environmental or potential even, environmental impact, they have to give notice to the public and provide an opportunity for a hearing in which if the public has any gripes, they bring them forward. They have to be factual. They have to be um, under, um, under, they have to have a foundation in evidence. You just can't go in and say, I don't like nukes. Doesn't work. You won't get a hearing. No, you have to have something specific. New England Coalition did that two years ago, three years ago on the new Seabrook license. In the middle of our intervention, <clears throat> all of the issues about the degradation of concrete at Seabrook came out. The original concrete mix for a lot of the buildings, including the ones that are safety significant at Seabrook, uh, brought in uh, aggregate from a pit in Maine, <laughs> which contained lots of a particular type of um, silicon compound that reacts with the um, alkaline in the concrete and produces a kind of slime that cracks the concrete and pushes it apart. Um, and that's what's going on at Seabrook. And so, and so uh, the containment uh, structure, that big heavy thing that was so important, it's it's got its, yeah, this thing right here. It's got its fractures in it. There's a tunnel that conducts seawater to the plant for cooling um, and gets rid of hot water. And it's cracking. The foundations of these buildings are cracking. We tried to put in a contention. You have to identify where you got your information. We cited an NRC meeting in which one of the staff people um, was presenting an opposing viewpoint. And the judges pointed out to us that you're not allowed to rely on what the NRC says, apparently. So anyway, so we got bounced. There's a, one of our um, allies, long-standing group um, in Newburyport, 10 miles away from Seabrook, less than 10 miles away from Seabrook, six, sure, um, has intervened on the silicon issue. They managed to get new information. They got some money to be able to hire experts to testify. Um, and those hearings are ongoing. Their, their, their petition was accepted. They're um, rolling forward. I think their first sit down real hearing um, is going to be in January or February. So that works. Um, my only point here really was that um, NEC was there um, and effectually. One, just one more point before I forget. Um, In 2008, I got a call from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. 
They said, Mr. Shaddis, we got your name here working with NEC, yes. He said, well, your, your 2206 petition that we set aside is uh, now ripe for consideration and we're taking it up again. I said, I filed a number of these. This is called an enforcement petition. It's to get them to enforce their rules, to point out somebody's breaking the rules. And I, I was like, well, I filed several in the last few years, but I think they've all been resolved. Um, what is this? And he said, well, New England Coalition filed this some time back, and um, it, the argument is that the, the um, government has not considered all the potential harm from all of the radionuclides that would be produced in an accident. And I was like, I don't remember anything like that. I said, what's the date on it? He said, 1976. <laughs> they took it off the shelf. Why? Because there was a new bunch of reactors being built in Georgia and in Florida. They were planning new reactors. They took it and put it on the shelf. Why? Because in 1976, all of the orders for reactors had dried up. NRC was not uh, assigning their people to deal with licensing of reactors. NEC, if, if there have been issues with nuclear power in New England, NEC has been there. Um, oh, yeah. So here we are, back to today. This is all very close to the end of this. Honors. My editing crew is right, stand, right with me today. OK. Um, yeah. So where we are, all the slides up to now have been from the beginning of the VY effort to the middle of the VY effort. This second half will go somewhat more quickly, most of it. 10 years is what the company projects from uh, point zero to completing the decommissioning. Decommissioning, by, according to NRC, rem uh, involves uh, the removal of systems, structures, and components to a degree where radiation is reduced to levels that will permit uh, un unrestricted access to the site. So step one, the decommissioning contractor, North Star, uh, will uh, bring its subcontractor in, Arriva. They will rip out the reactor internals. These are the things that hold the fuel and uh, the jet pumps and the rest of the stuff that's inside the reactor. All of that is, uh, mo almost all of it, is categorized as high-level waste. It will go into casks. Whatever is not high-level waste, uh, that is as hot as the nuclear fuel itself, um, will be shipped for disposal. Taking the reactor vessel and the reactor vessel internals out will remove 98% of all the radiation that's on site. Just like decay heat, that small percentage, that 2 or 3%, whatever it may be, of the radiation on site that has escaped from the fuel. We know where that is. That has escaped from the reactor vessel and the internals. We know where they are. Is out there in the ground and in the water. Um, and that will take the bulk of um, available for work decommissioning funds to clean up. That will take 
the remainder of the 10 years to clean up. Reactor vessel internals in the first two years, eight years of cleanup to follow. Um, and the New England Coalition is there again. We have a door to be there. We have an open door. No, no standing at the gate waving about our complaints. No, we are invited in, sit at the table, and say what we think. Well, what, think about what? Well, well, just for example, um, Mr. State, in conversation with me, said, yeah, he had no problem with surveying the school. He had done a very similar thing when they took apart a university um, test reactor, and he had gone through the halls with his Geiger counter, and um, it, it's all worked out just fine. Well, no, that's not how we sample if we're concerned about radioactive contamination. And so all the methods that um, Schuyler described before for Fukushima are the methods we will apply here. And that's the kind of thing where when the company comes in to an advisory group of local citizens and they say, well, what do you think? Um, can we just get away with waving a Geiger counter around? The answer is no, and then you begin a discussion about it. All of that is dynamic, ongoing, it's part of the work of NEC. The challenge now is to find the energy and the commitment to see it through. I told Mr. State that I was not prepared to spend 10 years working on another decommissioning, but I would put in some time in that first year to try to get a group, a, a representative group of stakeholders and local citizens, informed local citizens, um, together with the company to follow them through decommissioning and to look at the issues and if there were things that were unsatisfactory or could be done better, in our opinion, they would hear about it. Their job, and he agreed with this, is to, to give it respectful consideration. At Maine Yankee, we had such a group, an ad hoc group, not the, not the big citizens advisory panel, but a group that was at the plant pretty much weekly. Um, and when suggestions came in from the, the state technicians or, or um, from me, they had a form, an actual uh, printed out company form to follow that suggestion or that comment. There would be a person that was assigned to it that, that would take ownership of that issue. There was a person assigned that he would report to. There was a date inscribed when his preliminary response would be due. There was a date inscribed when his final response would be due. All of this is all flexible and changeable, but what they had was a an action matrix to deal with input from stakeholders. I'm hoping that as this thing progresses, we can work out something like that. A lot of people in the area have been very vocal, bless them, and it did help, about Vermont Yankee. But now, we need some of them, at least, to come join us in actually being present and following this decommissioning to see to it that all of the conditions that we applied are met um, and that as issues arise, we always take 
the more conservative, more um, precautionary approach. So that's the new game. First 13 slides, four, or 12, whatever it was, that's the first half of it. Now there's the second half. Now we clean up the uh, radioactive material that is already out there. So that's the end of my story. It's pretty hard um, because NRC, under both Democratic and Republican administrations, has since uh, probably since about 82, has done its best to make life easy on the industry. Um, and, you know, and that includes things like inventing the whole relicensing process, then making the relicensing process less formal, more streamlined, easier to do. Um, they instituted uh, uh, a, a number of rules which allow the company to do away with safety measures. For example, all the safety equipment in all reactors is required to be redundant. Two of them, two lines of, of uh, valves, switches, wiring, whatever it may be. NRC has allowed the companies to um, do a self-analysis and certify that the plant would be just as safe if while running, they shut one of these redundant systems off and repaired it, much like crawling out on the wing of the aircraft and repairing the engine, you know. But NRC thinks that's okay. They've done one step after another to eliminate meaningful public participation. They like the come by, uh, let's hold hands form of public participation or when the local children come in and put on a demonstration in the middle of a meeting, they love that. But they don't very much like um, a legal setting where everybody is under oath and they are required to produce evidence for what it is that they're saying. So anyway, my answer, short answer is, I think if, if Trump could figure out something to make life easier, on, uh, on the companies, he would, but NRC has done a very, very creative job of uh, uh, defanging their regulations. I don't think it's going to sorry for that. I'm sorry I was unclear about it. I, just, I mixed a couple of things together. One is the NRC definition of decommissioning, which is the removal of all of this material, the buildings and so on, down to the point uh, that the site is available for unrestricted access. That's one thing all the part by itself. That's their definition. Um, the other part was the schedule for um, North Star. And they are planning within the first two years um, by, what's two years? By 2020 to have um, pulled the reactor internals out, the reactor vessel out, um, uh, the immediately adjacent attached piping, all that stuff will be pulled out and shipped except for some of the reactor internals, which I suspect will be put into dry, and I say I suspect, will be put into dry cask because that's what we did at Maine Yankee. We have fuel and we also have some of the reactor internals, which are so intensely radioactive that in a radiation scale, there, you can't differentiate them from the fuel. They become that active. Right, I mentioned three casks for internals. Yeah, okay. Well, there you they go. Break them down Thank you. So they sit. They cut them up. Pardon me? They, they break them down so they sit in the yeah, they Yeah, they're, they're, as, uh, as Ned said, they are cut apart with torches underwater. And so the, so the rest which is going to be shipped, is that the things that aren't in casks? Well, the, the plan is to segment the reactor vessel, to cut it up and ship it. For, and the reactor vessel itself, once they clean it, will be low level, will be categorized as low level waste. If you remember the, the, the waste categorizations 
are low-level ways, and reactor fuel. High-level waste is reactor fuel. The only exception to that are those reactor internals that are so hot that they have to be treated the same as the fuel. So those are the two categories we have. Low-level waste can be low-level waste can be so radioactively hot that you can't get within a hundred feet of it. You know that it just be blistering radiation, but it's not as radioactive as the fuel. And that's the that's the cutoff line between. Um, high level and low level. We have a really big issue in the, in the storage of the high level waste. My opinion, it should never have been put where it has been put on site. It should have been moved across town, put in the gravel, unused gravel pit that's over there. How do you remove it? Across the well, it's away from the river and it's also on land that is not good for anything else. It is not an Indian burial site. It is not on the riverfront. It's just an abandoned, disused gravel pit. And it provides plenty of material to berm up around those casts to protect them from the impact of aircraft or, or, um, or missiles or anything. So, so right now, it is where it is. The money has been spent. There's no money or incentive to do anything further, although the town of Vernon will find it really difficult to develop that lot. It's a 130-acre lot. They're going to find it really difficult to develop that with the spent fuel sitting in the middle of it. They've gotten a license from NRC to tear it apart. The town of Vernon <laughs> is only too happy to have it remain an industrial site and, and hopefully wants to put something else in there. Um, you know, we fought the issue of rubbleization. Rubbleization in the industry, everybody in the nuclear industry and in the decommissioning industry understands that rubbleization is a way of mixing radioactive materials and non-radioactive materials to lower the average radiation reading for all of it and thereby enable you to bury it on site. That's what it's about, mixing. And so I've lost my train of thought. This happens from time to time. It just chugs, <laughs> chugs away out of sight. Oh, I, yeah. So we fought it. We fought it because I knew, and I brought that into the uh, discussion, I knew what it was for, what it was about, okay? The North Star told me that they were not inclined to do rebelization. They never had a plan to do rebelization until they sat down with the town of Vernon, and the town of Vernon said, my God, you're going to run all those trucks back and forth and rip up our roads. And not only that, but you don't need to put nice soil in there because this is going to be a redeveloped site. We don't want you to do, a, you know, take this stuff away. We want you to break it up and dump it in the foundations and pack it down and leave it on site. That'll save us a lot of hassle. That's the town of Vernon. So... We're not opponents of the town of Vernon, but we oppose them on some issues, and it's the way it's going to be.